Well, it was very nice to be asked to give this year's IABSI lecture, actually last year's, but the COVID pandemic put a stop to that, so it's moved on a year. When Ian Firth asked me to do it, I told him that we don't, in Price and Myers, design huge bridges or roofs of large stadia or things like that, and that our work has been at a smaller scale, and a lot of it has involved working on old buildings. Ian said he knew all that, and that was why he wanted me to give the lecture. Well, my working life has been in two parts. The first at Ovarum Partners and Arab Associates, and the second at Price and Myers, which I founded with Robert Myers in 1978. <clears throat> of course, there are big differences between Arabs and PNM. Arabs is now huge, and PNM is quite small. There are about 150 of us. And the work is entirely different in the two firms. In my 18 years in Arabs, of which nearly three were spent on site, I designed the structures of just four large buildings and a few small ones. In the 40 years of PNM, we've done about 30,000 jobs, and I was partner in charge for about two and a half thousand of them. I can't possibly give you even a superficial overview of 30,000 jobs. The range of our work is extraordinarily wide, from churches, eight of them cathedrals or equivalent, to hundreds of offices, some of them new, some of them refurbs, lots of housing and student accommodation, halls for music and drama, particularly for schools. And we've done a number of elegant footbridges, and throughout the last 20 years or so, we've designed over 200 new cantilevered stairs. And all the time, we've done hundreds and hundreds of jobs on houses, some very big and grand, and some very small and modest. Back extensions, roof extensions, internal alterations. This quantity of very different jobs, all at the same time, makes for a lively office. And the buildings we've worked on have won hundreds of awards, which is very much the point. If you want to see images of some of these things that we've been doing, for the last 40 years, you should look at our website. But what the website won't give you is a picture of where Robert and I came from. Our experience of working in Arab Associates and what we brought from Arabs to our new practice. What was completely new to us in PNM was the work on old buildings. I have a feeling that for many engineers who've worked only on large new buildings, that to move to a smaller scale and deal with old buildings would be felt to be very infradig. So I want to straight away dispel the idea that working on old buildings is in some way inferior to designing new ones. I have done lots of both, as I will show you, and I found both equally challenging and equally satisfying. I'm going to talk specifically about a few jobs on old buildings to show you what I mean. These are, at the moment, particularly relevant in the context of climate change, as we're being encouraged to think first of repairs and restoration, and to only demolish and rebuild if the existing building really cannot accommodate a new use. This issue of how we respond to the need to halve within the next nine years the CO2 emissions from construction is the one single most important influence on our work, what we do and how we do it. I hope that you have seen the president of the Institution of Civil Engineers, Rachel Skinner's excellent video, Shaping Zero, and also Mike Cook's gold medal address at the Institution of Structural Engineers. If you haven't yet, then I urge you to do so. These both spell out the crisis that is upon us and how we must halve the CO2 produced by construction by 2030. Kate Rayworth's Donut Economy may also be relevant reading. Getting more specific towards the details of how this might be achieved, Bureau Happold have produced a six-page guide to embodied carbon that sets out the CO2 for various materials, forms of construction, spans and loadings. And Price and Myers, working with Cambridge University, have produced the Panda computer program that tracks and calculates the embodied CO2 and cost 
in a large number of structural options as the design progresses, so that the engineer can see immediately the effects of different materials, changing spans and so on. These are similar approaches to the issue of making new buildings with very low embodied carbon. But there is another approach to the problem, which is to build less, or to make more use of our existing buildings. Work on old buildings is something that we in PNM have been doing for years, with no realisation that it might have significance beyond simply the good sense of not wasting assets and a strong interest in maintaining our built heritage. So I'm going to show you some examples of PNM's work where we have made very significant alterations to old buildings, or in some cases given a new life to an old building. These have been interesting and rewarding jobs. If this sort of work is to be the future for a lot of engineers, then there is every reason to be enthusiastic about the prospect. But to start at the beginning, I left Cambridge University in the autumn of 1960 with a rather average degree and a fairly good understanding of the science of engineering and practically no knowledge at all of how that science might be applied to making buildings in the real world. I joined over Arab Partners and started in Paul Beckman's group, where I really learnt what engineering design is about. Paul was a brilliant and slightly acerbic Dane and a fantastic teacher. The Danes were unquestionably the leaders in the design of reinforced concrete at that time, so Arabs turned out to be a very good choice for me. After this introduction to the realities of design, I went to Sussex University for 18 months as resident engineer. The buildings at Sussex were almost all made of precast concrete and the units were precast on site. They included beams up to 12 metres long with a board mark finish, weighing about 10 tonnes, sections of 200 millimetre thick floor slab and the vaulted units that you can see in this photograph that are a particular feature of the University of Sussex. With several buildings at different stages of construction and some only just starting, I got a really good view of the whole building process. After some months in the office and a short spell on another site, I went in early 1964 into the bush in northern Ghana. As resident engineer again, this time for two bridges over the black and white Volta rivers. The bridges were in, identical apart from the height of the piers. <clears throat> the contractor was Cementation, who had a team of eight expats, of whom only three were actually on the site all the time, directing the work. So it was quite impossible for the correct formal relationship between the contractor and resident engineer to be maintained. Cementation's engineer Roger and I worked together designing the concrete mixes, getting the sand from the white volta and the stone from the black, and sieving to get from 40 millimetres down to 20 millimetres down, using sieves made from two sheets of 50 millimetre weld mesh bought in the market in the nearest town, in, built into a wooden frame. We made very good concrete. We set out the bridge together, Steel tapes hung on catenary with springs along the river bank, temperature corrections, theodolite, seven figure log tables, no total stations in 1964. Cementation seemed to be surprised to discover that if you dig a hole in sand by a river, the water comes in. They tried it and it didn't work, so we clearly needed caissons. I was the only person on site who could design them, and so I designed the caissons. Uh, this is not really the job of the resident engineer, of course. There were concrete boxes cast on the sand, four feet high, because that's the size of a sheet of ply. Uh, when the concrete had gained strength, the sand inside was dug out, and the box slid down until the top was almost level with the ground again. Another four foot stuck on top, and the process repeated. This one that we're looking at in the middle of the river 
is 16 feet deep. Uh, there wasn't, in that case, there wasn't any sand in the middle of the river to build the case on, so we shoved the sand from the sides out and made it our own sandbank in the middle of the river and then built the case on top of it. All very satisfactory. One evening, the agent and the foreman Bill, who was a wild Irishman who'd gone a bit bush from a long time in West Africa, had a drink or two in the city bar, or maybe three or four, and Bill told the agent that he thought the agent knew nothing about how to build a bridge. And the agent sacked him, there and then. There was some discussion later about whether this was really quite the thing to do. Not at your place of work, both plastered, but notwithstanding all that, sacked Bill was, and he went back the next day to England. Then it became completely clear that there was not enough supervision on site, only the sub-agent and the engineer. The river was rising <coughs> and we had to get the piers up. When the river was going to come right up, it would be covering all the concrete that you can see there. So there was definitely urgency. And there was only one way of dealing with this. I took control of one of the piers, the others did the rest. And that's not what the RE is supposed to be doing either. When I left the site after 11 very enjoyable months, the first three spans were well on the way, like this. Steelwork delivered piece small, erected by this gantry on top. The steelwork cantilevering to the next pier, the cantilever deflection jacked out, rollers put in and continuing on. I can't really overemphasize the value of the site experience that I had. It taught me a huge amount about construction. Uh, I think it, site experience is absolutely essential as a part of a young engineer's education, whether he will become a consultant or a contractor. Uh, and if a consultant, it's essential, equally essential, because one can't design a structure without knowing exactly how to build it. In early 1965, I returned to England and led a group of four engineers and draftsmen from Arabs in the offices of Basil Spence, Bornington and Collins, architects. Their office was just in the corner of Fitzroy Square, a few yards from Arabs' main office. Jack Bonington was interested in setting up a multi-professional group and he'd also got services engineers from Steenson Varming and quantity surveyors from Reynolds and Young in his office. We designed a few small buildings, but the main job was the Sunderland Civic Centre. And this job had just about everything. It's a figure of eight of offices, 20,000 square metres of offices, to the right of that on this plan, a four-storey car park built over an active railway line, um, a bridge to be widened, the Park Lane Bridge up at the top there, another bridge to be rebuilt altogether, both of them over railway lines, and a little pre-stressed concrete footbridge at, in the middle at the bottom there. The bit that I shall talk about is just the design of the office building. Jack had drawn uh, the plan like this and identified two different widths of office needed, about 40 feet with one corridor in the middle and about 60 feet with two corridors in the middle and the stairs and labs and storage between them. And these are the dimensions that he set out, ideal approximate dimensions. Well, we had a go at designing this building in different ways None of them seemed to be very satisfactory. And then I had the idea that maybe I could apply an equilateral triangular grid to the whole thing. Because after all, it's all on 60 degrees, all these angles, 120 degrees, 60 degrees. So I drew lots and lots of triangles uh, on my uh, double elephant drawing board, put Jack's drawing underneath and tried to see how they fitted. The building shook slightly, I thought, wobbled and settled down and fitted exactly on my grid. The edge of the building is supported on five inch thick, 125 millimeter thick 
precast concrete mullions at five foot centers. Uh, and the middle of the building is supported on columns on the major grid, the 20 feet grid, which you can see heavier lines. When we came, so we saw that's how it would be would be built, would be designed, and how it would be built, and there would be flat slabs, and we designed the flat slabs by yield line, because of course after some time in Arabs, Johansson was absolutely in the bloodstream. So when we came to laying out the reinforcement on the drawings, we tried orthogonal steel, which of course is what you always use, and found it was a muddle at the corners really, with lap splices and laps and things, which used up a certain amount of steel and wasn't very pretty. And then somebody had the bright idea of going with the geometry of the building and putting in the steel on triangular system, as shown in this photograph. And we tried this out and it worked fine on the drawings. The uh, way it works is like this, two bars coming to the edge of the building at 60 degrees to the edge of the building and 60 degrees between them. Uh, will be T16s because they are dealing with a span from the edge to the middle. And the distribution steel, which makes up the third side of the triangle, will be a 12 millimeter bar. When you get to a corner, the 12 turns into a 16, one of the 16s turns into a 12, and it just carries on the same way. Very straightforward. Langs, who did a smashing job on this building, their steel fixers had absolutely no problem with this. Uh, and uh, it worked very well. Here is the finished building. Now, <clears throat> having, having uh, spent this time in Bonington's office, very enjoyably working with the architects, interior designers, and sometimes the services engineers, and going to lunch with them and sketching bits of building on paper napkins and all that sort of thing, really good stuff. I enjoyed it very much and I just thought it would be better if it wasn't different op firms forming this coalition, but just that it would all happen in one firm. And of course, that already existed in Arab Associates, which had been going for some time then. So I thought I'd like to try and move to Arab Associates, and I went and asked if I could have a job there. And I was interviewed for the job by Robert Myers, who had got there before me, so to speak. And he was the administrator of one of the groups the way Arab Associates organized itself was in groups of about 15, which would consist of four or five architects, two, maybe three structural engineers, three building services engineers usually, three quantity surveyors, usually a building surveyor, and an administrator. Total around about 15. Uh, and we all sat muddled up. There was no architects in one corner and engineers in another. It was totally multidisciplinary and it worked really well. The building that Robert <coughs> wanted me for as, a as the structural engineer was the central depot and housing at Kensington and Chelsea. The Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea wanted their engineering depot to be rebuilt, a new one, and also housing. This is a photograph of the model of the scheme. There's a rectangular building which has all the engineers' workshops in it, uh, for three stories and then housing on top and on the left a triangular building which has all the parking for everything. The, uh, it looks like this has built the engineers up to the cantilever and the housing on top as you can see. The plan of the engineers works is like this with the small workshops all around the outside of one very large central workshop with one column in the middle you can see a spot in the middle that's the column in the middle and here is the housing following the same sort of pattern, terraces around a courtyard. And here's a section of the building, four stories and three stories of housing on top of the engineering workshops, two stories of them, and then above them, the changing rooms for the engineers and showers and things like that. And the one big column in the middle supporting a paved, planted uh, courtyard. And that big column supports 16 uh, radiating beams, the longest of which is 33 meters. And these are made of post-tensioned lightweight aggregate, light ag in fact, concrete. Uh, 
I, we thought at the time that this might have been the biggest span of, of pre-stressed light ag concrete in the country. Very interesting piece of work. Molems, who were the contractors, who did a nice job on the building, were slightly shocked at how much cement had to be put in the mix before you get the strength needed to make it suitable for pre-stressing. This is the courtyard upstairs, warm brick, planting, paving, sun always shining, nice, very peaceful place, wonderful place to live. And joining the two buildings, the parking building and the, and the other building, is a three-storey high steel bridge spanning just over 40 metres, made entirely out of 114 millimetre diameter tube, with a walkway at the top for the people from housing to housing, walkway at the bottom for the workmen from their showers and changing rooms to their vehicles, and in between a duct carrying services. The next building that I designed in Arab Associates, uh, in a slightly reformed group, was this building for Lloyd's Insurance Brokers at Chatham. Robert Myers uh, had um, <clears throat> given up the job of administrator, I think rather gratefully, and had become the structural engineer. So Robert and I were structural engineers for this building. And there's, it, there's not an awful lot to be said about it really, and, but I will explain why it is so essentially part of the, engine, uh, the Arab Associates thinking. This is the building beyond the yachts and beyond our building, the old naval dockyard buildings. We were trying to ma ma um, replicate or follow the, the massing of the dockyard building, of course, and the pitch roofs. This is a fairly surprising pitch roof. At that time, most architects were doing flat roofs. They hadn't caught up with the idea that pitch roofs are better. This is the structure of the inside of the building. And this is typical of Arab Associates, which you must remember is an engineer's, is an architect's practice, architectural practice, in an engineer's office. And there were all the sorts of engineers involved. So the organisation of services was absolutely fundamental to the way in which the building is put together. What we're seeing here is a section through concrete pyramids. Uh, they're 7.5 metres square. They sit on their own four columns and the groups of columns come together to form a riser duct between the four columns, which you can see, and that gives the rising services a way to get up into the services, servicing space above the pyramids, which means that you don't have flat floor ceilings, which was the starting point. Nobody wanted flat floor ceilings, they're so boring, and in a big open plan office anyhow. <coughs> and, um, and we didn't, we, we wanted the services to be accessible from their own space so you didn't irritate people by putting ladders up in their offices and trying to get at ceiling tiles and stuff like that. Uh, the uh, space created li is like this, has a certain rhythm, seven and a half meter rhythm, and these are the units. A precast on site, of course we knew they would have to be precast because they're seven and a half meter square and you can't drive around England with something seven and a half meter square. But there was lots of room on site, so it was all part of the design to know that that was how it was to be made. We specified that they should be cast on steel moulds with steam heating and with a cover so that the quality could be maintained and they could be got out of the moulds quickly. We laid that down to avoid the builder having to try and invent these sort of things himself. We'd been working on the design building a long time and we knew how it should go and we knew how it should be built. And I just think we were always clear that it was not fair to, to land the contractor with lots of decisions to make on his own during his tender period. And I still feel that's right now. Uh, here are the units standing up and they are yet to have their upper stools put on and the in-situ slab on top of the whole thing. And here's the building finished. <clears throat> now, uh, after that, Robert and I worked on a large building for Saudi Arabia, uh, which um, was a very interesting experience. Uh, we never saw that building built, but I think it was built eventually. Uh, and in early 1965, no, in early 1978, uh, Robert and I decided 
we would like to leave Arab Associates and try and start our own firm of Price and Myers. If you'd asked us why we wanted to move, we'd probably have said that we wanted to be free from a large organisation and do our own thing and see if we could earn our own living. Sounding rather like Brexit. But if you asked what we hope to get in the way of work, we uh, would probably have said enough. But beyond that, we might have said that we hope to work with good architects and help to make some really good buildings. There was always the hope that we'll be able to use our experience of excellent design from Arab Associates. We started with lots and lots of small jobs, but after a bit we did start to pick up jobs of reasonable size quite quickly. But we have never dropped the small jobs, we still do them. At about this time, a uh, year or two after we had started, as the work increased, we were joined by three friends, all from Arabs, and we set up a partnership of five. Mike Lovick had been the site engineer on the building for Kensington and Chelsea, and Robert Afia had designed the structure for the beautiful Arab Associates building at St John's College, Oxford, the Thomas White building is called. Nick Hanneker, who was the youngest of the three, um, had been working in Arab's R&D. So we all had a lot of Arab experience in our blood. One of our first serious jobs was this treehouse for an architect friend. He rang up and said, uh, I just need a couple of timber beams. I want to build a treehouse uh, and the beams should span between two of my conifers. I said, Chris, do you have a look at the trees to see if they move the same way when the wind blows? And he looked and said, no, actually they don't. And I said, fine. So I designed sliding bearings at the joints. There's a pin through the tree and there's a slot in the wood and some sliding material, which I don't remember now what it was. And that's how it was. And as far as I know, it might still be there. After that, uh, we had, uh, I had a phone call from another architect who said, could I help with the design of a garden wall? And I said, yes, of course, garden wall. What sort of garden wall? And he said, it's to be 14 feet high and there's about 800 yards of it. I said, crikey, that's quite a garden wall. And he said, yes, it's to make a big wall garden for this house, Sutton Place, which is a grand house, old Jacobean, I think, in Surrey. Uh, and so I gave him an A4 sketch of a section of a garden wall after some discussion, and that was the end of that. But then, a few days later, he rang up again and said, um, he, meaning the client, Stanley Seeger, who bought the house from uh, Getty, uh, he would like uh, a lake. Can you do a lake? And I said, yes, I'm sure we can do a lake. So Robert and I put our heads together and uh, worked out how to do the lake. There's the garden wall, and here's the lake. Uh, the lake wasn't all that difficult to do. The ground was suitable below a certain amount of messy stuff, sort of standard England. There was proper clay, so dig the messy stuff out to make room for the water, get into the clay, dig up the clay, roll it out to make a, uh, a dam at the bottom of the slope, nice slope, and there you have it. Said quickly, it was all quite easy. Actually, it was something of a challenge because the ground wasn't very nice. After that, there was just one little gem of a job, very easy structurally, but a nice thing to do. This wall made of Carrara marble hung on concrete. So I designed concrete wall and uh, the Carrara marble is a complete uh, blow up of a maquette made by Ben Nicholson, which is in one of the museums in America. The maquette is four feet by two feet, plywood painted white, uh, and this is 30 feet by 15 feet. The next job that we got in PM, which was absolutely out of, one might say, the stable of uh, um, Arab Associates stuff for the colleges at Oxford and Cambridge was this one at St John's at Oxford. This is the building. It looks out onto the Fellows Garden, which is the grass in front here. 
there's a big old medieval wall which you can see uh, which uh, had to stay and so Richard McCormack the architect McCormack Jameson Pritchard Richard McCormack uh, designed the building to have a terrace at the level of the top of the wall and put the students rooms above so they would all get a view of the lovely garden uh, and put, put together entirely out of very sharp very high quality white precast concrete the section through the terrace is like this it's three big spaces uh, which are 10 meters square uh, which support partly all that housing and they, these three spaces consist of a dining hall on the right an open atrium in the middle and a theater small theater on the left the way this is structured is like this um, the, this is a corner of of a 10 meter square there's, there's a, a right angle bent the heavily rusticated concrete column co forming the corner and supporting beams all the way around and within that there's a little plinth with four little columns supporting a pendentive and sitting on the pendentives is a keystone all shown this is what it looks like built uh, at the top of this image is a keystone and beyond with the chains to take to take the rainwater is a pendentive uh, in detail it looks like this very beautiful high quality concrete uh, ballad and limestone aggregates and white cement the uh, outer wall heavily rusticated point tooled uh, then the lower levels of concrete um, needle gunned to give them a reasonable roughness and the four little small columns polished uh, uh, Histon Concrete did this they did a lovely job and uh, unfortunately they are no longer with us but they did a very nice job and the building got a Concrete Society Award here is one of the pendentives being finished you can see what's involved that's about 13 and a half tons of concrete doubly curved surface with holes with curved entrances to the holes uh, and different finishes on the different surfaces of that unit and quite something to make the stairs they up to the students rooms um, are formed are formed in the same way as they are in the old undergraduates buildings i.e hard materials in this case it's concrete 60 millimeter thick precast concrete treads 60 millimeters only just big enough to get the reinforcement in just uh, and um, it's the same concrete as the other concrete and they are supported on a drum of 100 millimeter thick uh, concrete blocks made curved and, and finished as you can see the the way this thing works is that if you stand on one tread your weight goes partly into the wall and partly onto the little black spindle which is threaded onto a baluster bar on the outer edge that spindle puts the load down onto the back of the next tread down which is supported under its front onto the next tread down so the treads are all in torsion and the torsion is taken by the wall and the load comes down onto a landing which can take the load of a short flight quite easily the purpose of doing it like this is to com have complete acoustic separation between the stairwell and the rooms so that the drunken student coming back late at night and reeling around and making a noise doesn't disturb the sleep of the uh, more assiduous ones there's a, a picture just showing how it's done you can see it's only 100 millimeters the wall the treads built into now two big alterations this is where we're on the saving the planet theme two big alterations the royal court theater in sloan square london this is the royal court looking out onto the square and if you went there by underground to go to the theater you would arrive in sloan square tube station here uh, which is right next door to the theater and over the railway line is this big riveted box steel um, iron, box 
which carries uh, a sewer, which is the old uh, Westbourne, the River Westbourne, which comes from up in Notting Hill somewhere and goes down to the Thames. If you stand on the pavement outside the Royal Court Theatre and look across the busy road of traffic going round the, round the square, you see on the other side of the road this little wall of stone which marks the entrance to the ladies' lavatories which were defunct, they closed them down. This is a model, a computer model that we made of the building to show what had to be done. And just about everything had to be done to this building. Starting at the front, uh, the stalls bar at the bottom was too small and smelt of drains, not very well ventilated, needed, really needed expanding. So Steve Tompkins, uh, Howard Tompkins, the architect, came up with the extraordinary idea, really, of extend, extending the stalls bar right under the road. Uh, and this was only possible because the uh, there, were, there were no services in the road, uh, of, uh, apart from wires, uh, but there was no there were no pipes, and um, nothing running to fall. So uh, that was the first job, and that extension went as close as we could get to the underground line, which you can see on the right hand side of the picture. Uh, then into the theatre itself, the ventilation in the theatre wasn't any good really it, because the air was coming in from the top, which isn't effective. Uh, as we now know, we would always put the air in at the bottom. And so we had to create a plenum under the stalls for the air to come in. And that's that big white box on the model. And then <clears throat> going up through the theatre, you have stalls, dress circle and upper circle. And then there's a level which is the um, rehearsal rooms. And then above that is another level which is the theatre upstairs, which is a little theatre. Um, and the acoustic separation between these three spaces, the theatre upstairs, the rehearsal rooms and the main house, was inadequate. So we needed concrete floors in there. That would involve a major change, but not losing, of course, the ceiling, the dome ceiling and everything over the main main house. And then going back further to the left, that black box is the fly tower. That was too low, so we added a story height on top of that, and it was too uh, shallow and needed more space under stage. Uh, we need more space, which meant going down a story height. Right next door to the sewer, the old Westbourne, which you can see right on the left there, shown as a round pipe, but actually it was egg-shaped Victorian brick sewer. And uh, <coughs> the, the, the uh, basic in alteration to the middle of the whole thing was done like this. Um, we put in two big steel beams that went from a new wall just inside the front door. So if you go through the front door into the theatre, You'll see in front of you the box office and behind the girl in the box office, and men in the box office, is a curved wall painted red. And these steel beams are supported on that wall and they go right through and sit on the proscenium arch at the back. You can see the dome uh, still suspended in its proper place underneath them. So all that work going down involved board pile walls big board pile walls and a lot of propping, complicated work. Uh, there was everything you can think of in the ground to, to be done. Uh, we did jet writing, we had lots of underpinning, we had low headroom board pile walls and big board pile walls, everything. It was uh, a ge geotechnical engineer's dream, I think, really everything was there. And here is the space, the only space that they had between the uh, theatre and the next door building to, for the contractor's plant for all this stuff that drives those various underground operations. Here is a piece, half of uh, the um, roadway being replaced over the new stalls bar, extended stalls bar. This is 13 and a half metres long, 175 millimetres I think thick, precast. It, it sits on uh, beams 
which are supported on plunge columns uh, down through the bar space. Uh, when in place, it's concreted over the top and then fill on top of that to take all the services, the wires and things in the road. And then we return that side of the road to the traffic and do the same thing on the other side of the road. The end result looks like this in the stalls bar. Fair face concrete, uh, nicely finished. And looking through that orange wall there is the wall of the ladies' lab. And the only reason we could do this uh, underground work was because the ladies' lab gave us a means of escape from the far end, which was essential. So, in the, inside the main theatre, uh, which had a complete overhaul, the plaster ceilings were taken down for various good reasons. And then Stephen Daldry, the artistic director, and Steve Tompkins, the architect, looked at these riveted girders and said they've got to be left. So we cleaned them and gave them some intumescent paint. And uh, Steve Tompkins managed to get enough money to do the most comfortable seats in any theatre in London. Wonderful leather seating. At the same time, we were doing a huge job on the Royal Festival Hall. Uh, this with Allies and Morrison architects. This, this uh, can really best be summed up in one slide, this work. This tremendous scaffolding here, which of course was designed by the scaffolder, but very much with us, saying where the loads can be taken and so on, was necessary to allow work in the roof space to happen in parallel with work uh, down below. Because the festival hall also had its air coming in from the top, dumping cold air down on people and not working very well, and it needed to be reversed. So we had to make a plenum underneath the stalls, which meant taking out all the uh, concrete planks that formed the support for the seating and turning them around and adjusting things so that there were slots between them for the air to come out. And up in the, in the roof, where there were trusses, I think about 15 feet deep, if I remember, there were masses of plant, air handling plant stuff, which was all redundant and needed to be taken out. And we also needed to get it out both, both because it was redundant, but also in order to try to improve the acoustic of the hall, which had never been really very good. And the acoustician thought it could be improved by increasing the volume, the effective volume. Uh, so that's what all this uh, scaffolding is about. Had there not been this complicated scaffolding and the very careful way of uh, organising where it should go, the whole job would have taken twice as long because that one job would have had to happen first and then the other one. Now, snake maltings um, is, a, is an absolutely first class example of a new life into an old building. It, Snape is in Suffolk. Uh, not far from the sea, not far from Aubrey. This is what the all things looked like when the business went bust in the 50s. And in 1966 or 5, uh, Benjamin Britten and Peter Pierce, who'd been running the Aubrey Festival of Music, asked Derek Sugden of Arab Associates if he could get a concert hall into the space underneath that big slope roof. And Derek said, with some modifications, yes, he could, and he did. And this is the end result. The roof has gone up a bit to increase the volume, uh, which is important acoustically, and the ventilators are still at the top. And this long building, which was just a plain building before Derek, uh, has had windows put in all the way along at two levels, one for the bar, which is the upper line of windows, and one for the artists dressing rooms down below. Uh, the, this is the concert hall that Derek created with the most elegant and beautiful roof structure and wonderful acoustic. Everyone said at the time it was the best hall in the country, seating about 800 people. This is a, a, an image of the whole site, the, uh, and it's the whole site quite a long way further on, where all the blue buildings are now music and the brown buildings are other things. The 
hall that Derek did is building eight, which you can see there, and building ten, eight being the concert hall and ten being the bar and the artists' dressing rooms. And uh, that was done in 66, and then again in 67, I think those were the years, there was a terrible fire which gutted the building, and it was rebuilt exactly as it had been in the first place. <coughs> um, but um, in, uh, let me see, it was uh, 97, 1997, uh, we got a job with Panoy and Prasad to look at building 10. They, Panoy and got the job from competition and asked us to help with the structural engineering. Uh, the, uh, all the music had decided, this is what the building looked like, you, you may remember after Derek had finished, all the music wanted more space for eating and drinking. And Sunan Prasad came up with the bright idea of taking the roof off, raising it uh, a metre and putting it back on a metre up. Of course, it wouldn't be the same roof, but that was the effect of the thing. And so we helped with that. Um, and it looks like that has finished, producing a very long, clear story all the way along. I'm not quite sure that the building, it looks exactly like a Victorian industrial building any longer, but it's, uh, it's, it's got the right shape anyhow, certainly. This is what the uh, section of that work looked like. Um, on the left, you can see section BB, uh, the old brick walls, dark and a, a beam spanning effectively between the two walls and with a portal frame on top. Uh, but the beam doesn't actually quite get to the walls. It stops short and it, then it puts a finger out onto the walls. It sort of makes clear that it is an introduction and the old walls are there and the new stuff is here. Um, and that's what it looks like as built. Now, the next job that we got, which was in 2004, was with Harth Tompkins this time, another competition, architect-led competition. And um, this was to sort out buildings five, six, and seven. Auburn Music wanted another concert hall where building seven is. In fact, the, what is shown here is the, the new hall that we built. What seven was not quite like that, wasn't roofed like that in the first place. Five and six uh, are externally hardly changed. In fact, in dimensions, overall dimensions, not didn't change at all. If you stood in that gap between the buildings over to the left and looked back at buildings five and six, you see this. There's uh, the kiln uh, on the left, the malt store in the middle, and uh, a general storage building on the right. Uh, and beyond that would be where our new concert hall to seat 300 odd people would go. We said uh, that the mall store would have to come out, first of all, to give the builder access through to the, to be able to build the new, uh, new big hall, well, 300 seat hall, uh, but also because it would become the get in, which means that there had to be space for decent sized things to get through bigger doors than they've got there and in the middle, and uh, also to provide access to the upper levels of the new new hall. So we said take it down and they took it down. And you can see now the kiln has now had its slates taken off. Slates would all be kept, any of them were any good, most of them probably a third thrown away. And then the roof was about to come off completely and be replaced in a new roof of steel with, uh, with uh, wood on top of it. And on top of the wood, sprayed concrete. This is sprayed concrete to uh, maintain acoustic separation between inside and outside. And this is what that space looks like when finished. And there's a new concrete mezzanine floor, uh, which gives access to the studio, which is in the kiln over to the left, and gives access straight ahead into the upper level of the new concert hall. The roof trusses, you might remember, well, everything was taken out of here, it was an open space. Roof trusses were taken out, put into one of the empty sheds on the site, cleaned up by hay mills, bits patched in if things had gone rotten, 
new struts put in to make them into king post trusses and put back just as they were. The first two at exactly the same level as they'd always been at, and the next two higher to get headroom over the mezzanine. This is the demolition of the building to make way for the new hall. Uh, you, you can see Suffolk red bricks being saved, cleaned, saved and stored on pallets. Any timber in that building was taken and saved in one of the sheds on the site. Every bit of material that was savable was saved. And that's what it looks like when finished. Very, very similar. The, as I said, the overall dimensions of these three buildings are the same. Uh, the only thing that you might notice differently is that there is a large roof beyond, which is the roof of the new hall. And the inside of the new hall looks like this. <clears throat> the steelwork, which you can only just see above the uh, lighting bars, um, the steelwork is uh, pretty well the same geometry as the uh, roof structure of the original hall done by Derek, the bigger hall done by Derek. Uh, but this is steel because on top of this roof is 250 tons of concrete to provide the acoustic uh, isolation of the hall from the outside world. Now, a little thing about saving the planet, a warning about saving the planet. Standing outside the uh, Snape Maltings buildings and looking towards the sea, there is, you see in front of you this sculpture by Barbara Hepworth. And it normally looks like that. But on occasions, it looks like this. And this is not caused by a spring tide. This photograph was taken between springs and neaps, and it's been caused by a tidal surge, which is created by very strong northerly winds up the north coast, somewhere up by Yorkshire or even further north, which stacks up the water down the North Sea, stops the East Anglian rivers from being able to discharge, I think it gives some trouble to the Dutch as well. Anyhow, the level of the water here is about four inches below the top of the sea wall at Snape. And we're of course being told all the time this is going to get worse and they're going to have to do something about this and soon. Now, three more halls made into old buildings and a small opera house. This is St. Edward's School at Oxford, uh, and I was asked, in fact, uh, by the school if it was basically feasible to turn the swimming pool into a theatre. And I said, yes, I thought it was, that you could perhaps put the stalls down into the pool, uh, but the roof would be taken off and completely replaced, because the, uh, the pool's roof was quite light steelwork, and it wouldn't carry stage equipment and uh, the ga galleries that are needed for access to lighting and things like that. And we could do that by building a completely new timber construction inside the old building. This would avoid putting any extra load on the walls. So this, this framing of posts and gallery supports the roof as well. And, uh, and saves the walls from extra load. And you can see the seats are in, in, the, in the pool. And this is the old malt house at the King's School, Canterbury, where Tim Ronalds and we have created a little theatre inside this old building. Very nice. I think this old brickwork is always most attractive. The previous one was Howard Tompkins again, the St. Edward's. And this is... Uh, rather surprising is making the point that buildings don't have to be lovely uh, in order to be worth saving. I mean this is not a lovely building, it was the old Territorial Army building just out of Dean's Yard in Westminster. Westminster School bought the building and to turn it into a music school and uh, this is the main small recital hall for the music school. Uh, down out of sight and unphotographable there's a lot of work downstairs, piling, piling, very low headroom piling to get the space occupied as as far as possible, right out of the bottom walls. Uh, and here the uh, old roof truss is kept, of course, as you can see, but the roof coverings changed again to try and control the acoustics. 
This is Neville Holt, which is uh, an old, old house, uh, which uh, where the owner wanted to build a little opera house for elegant opera in the country. This is the sort of thing that Glyndebourne has spawned, you might say, uh, of, um, of uh, doing opera rather grandly uh, in the country at a very high standard. There's no question that, that uh, the standard is, uh, is not good in these places. And this building in front of us has a courtyard in the middle, and the idea was to put a theatre into the courtyard. So the courtyard had to be excavated to get the plenum under the stall seating and the space under the stage and so on, right down, good big story height. We didn't want to underpin the walls, so we uh, said that the ground should be retained and the walls foundation should be retained by the retaining wall built close against them in stages like underpinning so that nothing slipped while it was happening. So that's what that's doing. And then the new roof sits on the old walls and there's a bit of a battle between the eaves of the new roof and the eaves of the old roof because they all occur on top of the wall and that is resolved by some crafted little stools of concrete which um, uh, raise the level of the wall plate of the new roof so that it's clear of the old one. And the space inside looks like this. Very nice, I think. Now, I just wanted to say one a word or two about working abroad, foreign stuff. Uh, and this does have a, a bit of relevance, I think, to the um, discussion about climate change. Um, <clears throat> we've had several jobs in uh, in different parts of the world out, away. Uh, I've had several jobs in Egypt. Robert Myers has been to Uzbekistan. And uh, the job I'm going to talk about is in Uganda, where we've done two jobs. This is in Western Uganda, a place called Kasezi which is over towards the Nile. Uh, this little building uh, was, a, was really a trial to m make sure that the materials that could be used uh, would do what was wanted. Uh, this, for this job and for the other job in Uganda, uh, the architect was Richard Nightingale uh, from Kilburn Nightingale. And Richard knows Africa very well and a lot of other parts of the world as well. And his whole approach is, if you go to somebody else's country, you use their materials and their expertise. You do not try to impose your materials or your um, expertise on them. Uh, you, you, if you want to work there, you do it their way. So um, let's, next image is Richard in the builder's yard with a mock-up of a piece of roof with some hips, probably a mock-up for the roof that we saw in the first picture. The roofing is steel sheets which come from 40-gallon oil drums. They take the top and the bottom of the drums off, cut them off, and cut the drum down vertically and then flatten it out and it makes a glorious great big roofing tile. Wonderful reuse of material. This is not Richard's idea, this is what they were already doing. But Richard saw that they were doing it and thought that was just what they should be doing. You can make a very handsome roof, as you saw in the first photograph with this. Inside the building, <coughs> everything is wood. And that wood is eucalyptus, because eucalyptus is what grows in western Uganda. So you're a mile away from British standard anything about wood. You've just got bits of wood. How good are they? The builder knows, you hope, he did here, what he's doing. He knows that the trees that grow down by the river grow too fast because of all the water and they're not strong enough. So he goes halfway up the hill and cuts down the trees up there for his wood. Um, that's all fine and he says it's fine, but you would like to have some sort of science applied to this a bit so you knew what was going on. So I got them to cut um, half a dozen 40 by 40 timber battens 
and uh, put two oil drums that that distance apart and span the, the gap with these patterns. Hung a bag of cement of known weight off the middle of one of the battens and measure the deflection against the other battens. Do that however many times you've got battens and you get something to average. And from that deflection, of course, you can calculate the Young's modulus of the wood. And from the Young's modulus, you can infer the strength of the wood. So we did all that. And the answer was, uh, it was um, just about as good as British softwood. Now, uh, I would just like to finish with some thoughts about dealing with climate change, because this is a really serious issue for us all. Um, when our status is not acknowledged by society, most of the time, I think, and we don't feel we're being well enough paid, we are proud to say that just about everything that we need to support ourselves in contemporary life has been designed and made by engineers. Cars, planes, fridges, electricity, buildings, whatever you like, you name it. It's all been done by engineers. We are essential. We invented the Industrial Revolution. So it absolutely follows that engineers are the only people who can reverse this damage. We're told that construction causes about 30% of carbon emissions. So something very drastic needs to happen and quickly. We are well beyond the point where we can feel good about putting less cement in the concrete. We will have to build less or build very much more economically or make use of old buildings, of course. Just remember that without us, nothing can be built. We are on the front line and we must accept responsibility. It won't be good enough to say, but the government asked us to do this or our client said he wanted this. We will be culpable if we go ahead and do it. So are we to become the environmental conscience of the country? How might we take the heat out of this? Civil engineers will be at the front of this before embarking on the design of a bridge or a tunnel, perhaps to connect Scotland to Northern Ireland, for example. The first question to be asked would be, how much CO2 will be emitted by the construction of this bridge or tunnel? And how much CO2 emitted by the boats can be ultimately saved? And if the answer to that question is not satisfactory and runs into a very long time, hundreds of years, then the bridge or tunnel doesn't get designed, let alone built. And the engineer is in a position to be able to say that. Structural engineers may find themselves in different difficult situations because they always work with an architect who they may have known for some years. It's obviously clearly important that architect and engineer have the same set of values. The result of taking the right actions may be that we will have to drastically slow down our building and infrastructure programs, in which case engineers looking for work could do a lot worse than follow the advice of Kate Rayworth in her donut economy and join Joe De Silva in sub-Saharan Africa, like the building in front of you, and help the poor people there to get a better life. Thank you.